Fast Track is a procedural mechanism that delegates all of Congress's constitutional authority to set the contents of our trade agreements over to the executive branch. And it does so in a way that disempowers the public in Congress and lets a few special interests capture the agenda, which is why Fast Track enables things like NAFTA, CAFTA, and WTO. So let's talk about what Fast Track is. Fast Track is a system that Congress agreed to. It was legislation passed by Congress. What Fast Track says is that when there is a trade agreement negotiated, and a trade agreement that, mind you, has thousands and thousands of pages of detail in it, it goes to Congress and it has to be voted up or down within 90 days and no amendments are allowed. As a mill worker, former state legislator, a congressman, and a lifelong resident of the state of Maine, I've had first-hand experience of the devastation of the so-called free trade agreements on the United States economy. I know what it means to real working people. NAFTA and other ill-conceived trade agreements have been nothing but disastrous for our state costing the people of Maine over 24,000 high-paying manufacturing jobs in the last eight years. In fact, Maine has lost the greatest percentage of its manufacturing jobs than any other state in the last three years. But the threat of job losses is not falling upon blue-collar workers alone. There's high-tech companies like IBM, Boeing, General Electric, are taking their computers and engineers, their jobs, over to China, India, and the Far East. Our jobs, our livelihood, our ability to provide to our families should not be traded on the open market. And the loss of manufacturing is especially important because manufacturing is the economy's leader in productivity, in technological progress, and in the creation of high-wage jobs. Jobs in manufacturing still, despite tremendous downward pressure caused, in my view, by wrong-headed trade and globalization policies, manufacturing still typically pays about 20 or 25 percent more than the typical service sector job. It's also historically the only sector of the American economy with any record of enabling working class Americans and their families to lead middle class lives. That's, and in fact, the state of Maine, though, is very much like the American economy as a whole. The sectors that are doing well have absolutely nothing to do with international trade. The fast track enabled trade agreements like NAFTA, CAFTA, and WTO contain special privileges for companies that relocate. So, perversely, you get better treatment if you offshore jobs and go move your production and become a foreign investor in another country than you do if you stay in your own country. And so under NAFTA, you had U.S. companies moving to Canada where wages were higher because leaving gave you benefits under these agreements. The result? After NAFTA and WTO have been in effect for a dozen years, we've seen three million manufacturing jobs go. That's one in six of every U.S. manufacturing job. And if it wasn't your job, it still affects you. Number one, we can't make any more the basic goods we need for our infrastructure. We can't make the big steel beams that we need to build the bridges and roads in our own cities. Our troops were sent off to Iraq in sitting duck, green jungle camouflage uniforms, because we don't make the desert camouflage. We were waiting for it to come from China. We shut down those shops and offshored it. And also, all of this offshoring is moving up the wage scale. We now have Alan Blinder, Princeton economics professor, NAFTA and WTO supporter, and former Fed Reserve vice president, saying that we have 28 million to 34 million high-tech service sector brain jobs subject to offshoring in the next 10 years. What jobs are there going to be under these rules? jobs are on a fast 
track to Mexico. But don't think for a minute that that train stops in Mexico. That train is moving those jobs as fast as it can to whatever country has the lowest wages and the least protection for workers. See the banner behind us that says the last union made Portland Freightliner. It was built, it's gone, Freightliner will no longer be built in Portland. With 800 people being laid off, and the last Freightliner produced in Portland, the company is building a new $300 million plant in northern Mexico near Monterey. Enough is enough. We've had enough of these trade deals that send our jobs out of the country. We and I didn't never think in, in, this, in this day and time that uh, Congress and corporate America be trading jobs, you know, gambling with people's lives. Hi, I'm Elmore Riley. Um, this is my third time as a 13-year employee, and I'm just saying it's time for this to stop. It just has yeah. to stop. And saying this trade agreement is not good for none of us in America. Hi, my name is Jason Pickard. I've been an employee with Freightliner since 1993. Uh, a lot of people that are second or third generation Freightliner employees it's a 60-year tradition of building Freightliners here in Portland. This is where the company started. And now they're sending all the, the Freightliners down to Mexico, sending them away from us. Like the gentleman before me just said, all of our stuff is going out and then they're selling it back to us. If all of our decent paying jobs are going away, we're not gonna have the money to buy anything. That's right, that's right. That's right. I'm Joe Instance, I'm also a machinist. Not only is the 800 people losing their jobs at Freightliner, I want to mention to everyone there's many, many vendors that right. supply products for us in the city and in Washington and in Oregon. Right. There's ConMet, there's Trim Systems, and the list goes on and on and on. Most of these companies are also leaving Oregon and Washington and moving to Mexico. So there's five jobs for every job that's, lose, that's lost at Freightliner. There's five other people in the community that are going to lose jobs. Right on down to the guy at the grocery store. The decisions that Congress is going to make this spring, fast track, I think it's got to be rejected unconditionally. I don't see why there has to be any specific legislative authority for the president to pursue trade agreements. The president could do anything that, that, that he feels like in various areas. Um, he already does, and trade should not be any exception. He should be free to pursue whatever trade agreements he seek, that he wants, and bring them back to the U.S. Congress, which should have the authority to deal with them as it deals with every other area of U.S. public policy, making whatever changes they want to and talking about them for as long as they want to. And what Fast Track does is it limits debate, it's only a few hours, and it forces that up or down vote, as you all know. Why was that done? To shut domestic producer and worker interests out of the trade policy making process. <clears throat> Why did the Constitution require that Congress handle trade policy? Because it knew that the legislature was the closest, was, was the branch of the American government closest to and most accountable to the American people. No fast track. The president is free to do whatever he wants to. Congress is free to do whatever it, whatever it wants to. The Founding Fathers, when they wrote the Constitution, gave Congress exclusive control to set the terms of commerce with foreign nations. And this wasn't an accident. If you read the Federalist Papers, they actually describe how, for trade policy, they wanted to give power to Congress, the branch closest to the people. The Federalist Papers talk about how the king, in that case the King of England, had been able to exploit his powers over trade to do favors for countries, foreign countries, or particular special interests, not thinking of the interests of the people. And in fact, our country started in a major trade war. It was a tariff on tea that caused the Boston Tea Party. And the founders of this country said, we don't want president to do that to us. And that's why they gave the authority to Congress.